Welcome to the AFA Distinguished Lecture for 2022. I'm Laura Starks and it's my privilege today to introduce Emmy Nakamura, who will give the AFA lecture. Each year, this lecture is given by a scholar who's not directly in finance, but whose research has important bearing on finance issues, and that is certainly true today. The introduction of Emmy could take a long time, but since we all want to hear what she has to say about a critical topic, I will keep my introduction brief. Emmy grew up in Alberta, Canada with, with economists Alice and Maceo Nakamura as her parents. She earned an undergraduate degree in economics from Princeton and a PhD in economics from Harvard. She's already contributed a great deal to the economics profession. Her current positions include the Chancellor's Professor of Economics at the University of California, Berkeley, co-editor of the American Economic Review, co-director of the NBER Monetary Economics Program, a member of the AEA Executive Committee, and on the CBO's panel of economic advisors. And I can keep going, but those are just, just some of, of what she is doing currently. She's an award-winning creative researcher and her many research awards include the John Bates Clark Medal in 2019, being named to the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, being named by The Economist Magazine as one of the decade's eight best young economists, being named by the IMF as a member of Generation Next, top 25 economists under 45. She has won the Elaine Bennett Research Prize from the AEA, a Sloan Research Fellowship and the Career Award from the NSF. Emmy is a thought leader in monetary policy, and I can think of no topic more pressing today than a better understanding of inflation. As Janice Eberly and Michael Woodford pointed out in a 2020 Journal of Economic Perspective article, Emmy has made a signature contribution to the field by integrating mac microeconomic and macroeconomic theory with data to increase our understanding of some of the most consequential, challenging, and longstanding questions in macroeconomics. Emmy analyzes macro questions by considering implications that arise in more disaggregated or higher frequency data or extending over a longer historical period. Her empirical work requires painstaking analysis of data sources not previously exploited, and she's been notably creative in developing and using new sources of data. By bringing together insightful modeling and new data resources, she has managed to isolate variation in microdata it is more credible for drawing causal inferences. Moreover, she can then relate these results to earlier estimation approaches, interpreting existing evidence in light of new methods and models. Emmy has made significant contributions to several areas of economics, including models of price adjustment, models of pass-through of cost to prices, empirical studies of asset pricing, empirical studies of fiscal stimulus, and the effects of monetary policy. Many of these contributions have, all, have also been made in collaboration with their co-author, John Steinson. Today, Emmy will be talking about micro and macro evidence on inflation and monetary policy. And I very much look forward to learning more about her, learning more from her about this. And you can just uh, put your questions in the Q and A and then later Emmy will take those questions. Thank you, Emmy. Okay, well, let me first say thank you very much for that very gracious introduction, Laura, and particularly for inviting me to give this lecture. As you said, this is an incredibly topical issue, but I think it's also one where um, macroeconomics and finance have a lot to learn from each other. So I think it's one where um, there's a really useful dialogue that can go on between the two fields. So uh, like you said, um, my talk is about micro and macro evidence on inflation and monetary policy. And I want to um, you know, start with a statement that um, you know, monetary policy is something that we think about every day, um, particularly uh, recently uh, when monetary policy has been so much in the news. And there's a consensus um, pretty much in the mainstream media that the effects of monetary policy are large. Uh, this is probably something that many of you think about every day in your research, thinking about the effects of Fed actions, inflation risk premia, things like this. This is in some sense the bread and butter of a lot of research uh, in finance as well as in macro. But the first thing that I want to start by reminding you of is uh, the fact that in some sense it is actually surprising, even though uh, we take it for granted. Um, why is it surprising? Well, monetary policy, you have to remember, is actually just about units. Um, and, and units aren't something that we normally think uh, would have an impact on the real economy. So say 
whether I measure your height in, in inches or centimeters, you wouldn't normally think of that as something which would matter for how tall you are. And so there's a sense in which it's, it's surprising that monetary policy does anything at all. Um, so some examples of this. Suppose I double the money supply, um, but suppose all prices double at the same time. Suppose I double the nominal interest rate, um, but inflation rises by the same amount. Suppose the exchange rate devalues, but at the same time, the relative price of products in the home versus the foreign country adjusts by the same amount, then maybe the nominal exchange rate devalued, but the real relative price between two countries actually didn't change. So these are all examples um, where even though there was a nominal action, so the nominal money supply doubled, but the real money, money supply didn't change, the nominal interest rate changed, but the real interest rate didn't change, uh, the nominal exchange rate changed, but the real exchange rate didn't change, where it really becomes salient, uh, the extent to which monetary policy is a matter of units. And you can see how it really could happen uh, that monetary policy um, could be irrelevant. I think in, in, in thinking about um, sort of the, the surprising way in which uh, monetary policy affects things, it's useful to go back to this very clever analogy by Milton Friedman uh, to the case of daylight savings time. So every year um, in the United States and many other countries around the world, we change the clocks. Uh, so this year, it will be March 13, 2022. The clocks will roll forward by one hour. Um, and the idea, of course, is that this sort of optimizes uh, the, the time of meetings relative to daylight, the time when it's, it's, it's most nice to be outside and doing things and so on. Now, of course, in a, in a perfect world, you can imagine a situation where we're all already thinking about this in how we set our schedules. So when you and I decide to have a meeting, um, you know, maybe we decide to choose a time uh, when it's going to be nice outside to meet. When we set the times of school schedules or work schedules, you can imagine maybe we take into consideration, um, you know, the, the daylight. And of course, this is true as a general matter that work schedules are, are set in relation to, um, to, to, to the weather and to, uh, to when daylight is available. Now, if all of that was optimally done all the time, um, so the meetings were uh, determined optimally already, then when daylight savings time rolled around um, on March 13th, then it wouldn't matter um, because, um, you know, because we would have already set everything um, optimally um, and, and there wouldn't be any impact of this change uh, in the clocks. But apparently it does. Uh, in fact, uh, there's evidence that uh, people don't sleep as much that night and there are even are a, a few more heart attacks on, on March 14th than normally there are. Now, when you think about this analogy um, of Milton Friedman's, you know, you immediately think of, of what you might call obvious reasons why that this might be the case. Um, so you know, what, what, why would it be um, that we use daylight savings time um, instead of just all continuously changing the time of our meetings, the time of school schedules, the time of work schedules to line up with uh, daylight hours? Well, one reason is just simplicity. It's a lot easier to have um, a constant time for my class, you know, Tuesdays and Thursdays at 10 a.m. instead of having that change continuously. Even beyond my private costs of keeping track of, you know, a continuously changing schedule, there's an issue of coordinating with other people. So uh, what if I choose a continuously changing schedule, but what if I'm not quite on the, the same schedule as other people? Uh, that's gonna cause a problem. Uh, because, um, you know, people need to go from one class to the other, they need to be able to coordinate school and work. Um, and so in addition to any private costs that I might face of a continuously changing schedule, there's an issue that it also amplifies coordination uh, frictions. And so those are, those are ideas that, that you know, I, I hope are intuitive to you, and I want you to kind of keep them in your mind, because uh, many of those same ideas um, will be ones that motivate us in thinking about prices and why they behave in the way that they do. So now I want to move from these, these conceptual ideas, um, sort of um, uh, about why it might be that you would see some imperfections in the adjustment of prices and move on to the evidence 
I'm going to talk about two kinds of evidence. Um, the first is micro evidence on prices, and the second is macro evidence. So the first, broadly speaking, is going to relate to direct data on price rigidity for individual products. And the second is going to relate to inflation um, and, and the broader discussion of those. So let me start with this picture here. So this is a picture of uh, the prices of haircuts in Italy and France. This is from a paper, a survey paper by Dine et al. from 2006. Um, the gray line is the price of a French hairdresser. The black line is the price of an Italian hairdresser. And this picture spans uh, about a decade. So the notable thing here is that you can see that there are pretty long periods of time when these prices remain unchanged. Actually, in the case of the Italian hairdresser, you know, it's really several years when the price remains unchanged. Now, if you, you know, think about your own uh, experiences at, at the hairdresser, I'm, I'm imagining that this won't seem so uh, foreign to you. But, you know, the, the basic idea of looking at, um, at individual products and observing price rigidity is that it seems unlikely when we think about supply and demand and all the factors that go into cost, that literally nothing changed over these four years. And so this is sort of some prima facie evidence that there's some kind of barrier uh, to, to price adjustment. Now, it might not be that costly um, for the people involved. So in particular, this period of time in Italy was one of pretty low inflation. Um, so it's not like this Italian hairdresser is, is necessarily hemorrhaging money because of the, the price being fixed. Um, and after all, wages might not have been adjusting much either over this period of time. But nevertheless, the, the basic idea is that uh, because you would envision that something changes, um, you know, even from one day to the next, the fact that you see so many cases where prices are literally unchanged um, is, is, is basic and sort of simple evidence for the idea that there's some kind of a friction. Here's another picture. Um, here in the coffee market, we have the advantage that because a constant uh, weight of coffee beans goes into a given can of Folgers or Maxwell House, we can actually have some reasonable measure of costs. And the gray line here is the coffee commodity cost, um, looking at you know, the price of, of the coffee beans that are going into the can. The black line is um, the wholesale price of a particular brand of ground coffee in the United States, so say Folgers or Maxwell House. And we're looking at a period between 1997 and 2004. So what you see here looks pretty intuitive when, um, when costs move by a lot. Um, like during this period here, you see that prices um, adjust multiple times. In contrast, in periods where costs are, are very stable, then you see that prices can be unchanged for long periods of time. Um, so it looks like there's some kind of a cost uh, to price adjustment, um, which, which means that when the benefits are low, there aren't many adjustments, but at the same time, when the benefits are high, uh, there are many more adjustments. Here's uh, yet another picture, which looks more complicated. Uh, so this is a picture of saltine crackers uh, from Dominic's Finer Foods in Chicago. So this data set, um, which is hosted um, at the University of Chicago, uh, has, you know, has been very helpful to a lot of researchers in thinking about prices. Um, and here we're looking at supermarket prices. Now this one is a lot more complicated. Um, are prices sticky or are they flexible in this picture? It's hard to say. On the one hand, you see an incredible number of price changes, you know, these icicles in the picture. On the other hand, uh, it doesn't look like the kind of perfectly flexible price that you would imagine naturally coming out um, of, of a model of demand and supply, at least with sort of a standard distribution of, of shocks, because there's this sticky upper bound, um, which is in fact the regular price of the product. So what you're really seeing here is a bunch of regular prices um, and sales and very frequent sales. So here you, you see one of the challenges um, of trying to measure price rigidity. You know, it, it, it immediately sort of seems like a very simple thing to measure. You just measure how often prices change. But when you see a series like this, you, you realize uh, that it's not as simple as it appears. Um, and trying to deal with these complexities is one of the things um, that has been um, an important sort of objective in the price rigidity literature in, in recent years and has actually led people to go beyond uh, simple models where there are just barriers to price adjustment to thinking about things like information rigidity. 
So maybe it's not about only whether or not you change your price, but, but when you update the information you use in setting your price. Now, this issue of sales um, is something that has become increasingly important in the US economy. So here I'm, used, I'm showing you the frequency of sales in four different product categories. So this is processed and unprocessed food, clothing, and household furnishings. And uh, I'm showing you the frequency of sales going back about four decades. And you can see that there's been a pretty unbroken increase in the frequency of sales in these different product categories over the time period I'm, I'm showing you. And presumably this has a lot to do um, with the increasing ability and interest of these, um, of these manufacturers uh, and, and retailers in price discrimination. So this, uh, this has been a major phenomenon in, in many sectors. And again, something that has, you know, complicates uh, the way that we uh, interpret price flexibility. It's not something that appears in all sectors. So I showed you haircuts before, and it's, it's something that's much less prevalent in services than in goods. When uh, it comes to the regular price though, um, so that was that sticky upper bound, or in the case of services uh, where there aren't many sales, it's the overall price. It turns out that pretty simple SS kind of models can explain the behavior of price adjustment reasonably well. So here I'm showing you um, CPI inflation, that's the gray line, uh, and I'm showing you the frequency of price change by year going back to the late 1970s. In the late 1970s, there was a lot of inflation and uh, the frequency of price change was high. Um, and in contrast, as, as inflation fell rapidly, and I'll talk a lot more about this episode later in the talk, you see that the frequency of price change dropped pretty dramatically. So what this means is that if you take a simple SS model, which just has you know, a fixed probability of price adjustment and you apply it to the entire time series of regular price changes, you actually get a reasonably good fit to the data. So here I'm showing you the actual frequency of price change in the US data. So this is based on the, the uh, micro data that underlie the US Consumer Price Index, um, measuring the frequency of price increases and price decreases. And I'm uh, with the solid lines um, showing you the predictions of a simple adjustment cost model, um, the implications for the frequency with which prices are adjusted up or down. And, and you get this you know, intuitive prediction of the model, you know, which actually fits the data, which is that back in the uh, late 1970s and early 1980s you saw a lot of price adjustments particularly price increases uh, but since then uh, this has fallen dramatically one interesting prediction of the ss model that actually does line up with the data is that all of the variation in the frequency of price change has to do with frequency of price increases and not decreases and that comes from the fact that there's this upward drift in prices which means that that this is what uh, this ss model predicts so even despite all the complexities in price adjustment, this huge increase in price discrimination and sales, perhaps somewhat surprisingly, um, you, can, you can represent price adjustment um, fairly well um, using, using a simple model um, of, of price adjustment. You know, for example, you might have expected that there would be an upward trend um, in the frequency of price change because of all of the innovations um, having to do with uh, price adjustment on the technological front, the fact that it's just become easier to price change prices over time with new technologies and so on. And, and while we do see that with sales, we actually don't see that um, with regular prices, which, which I think suggests that it's probably not just technology um, that is holding firms back from changing at least their regular prices all the time, but something about how they interact with their consumers. So at this point, you might be saying to yourself, um, this talk um, is, um, is, is, is focusing on things like the prices of haircuts, um, saltine crackers, um, and so on. Where is this really going? Uh, you know, I didn't get into economics to think about things like this. You know, I have better things to do with my time. Uh, and why am I telling you all this? Well, let me next try to convince you um, that even though I'm talking about saltine crackers, uh, these are things um, that you may want to think about a little bit, at least. So why is that? Well, one of the big ideas in macroeconomics uh, in recent decades is that um, even though these are small mistakes on the part of individual firms, so I've tried to make the point that 
you know, for the individual, say, coffee manufacturer that is not continuously adjusting their, their price to commodity prices, this is not leaving a huge amount of money on the table. But even so, um, when you have a lot of price setters, when you have a lot of firms in the economy making these small mistakes, or, or not necessarily mistakes, but just small deviations from what would happen with total price flexibility, all of these little deviations um, from perfect markets can actually add up to a big deviation in total. So let me walk through an example with that. So think about a deleveraging shock. So this is the kind of shock that a lot of people think was important in the Great Recession, the financial crisis in 2007 and 2008. So essentially, this is a big increase in people's desire to save. So what would happen in a perfect markets model? In this scenario, in a perfect markets model, what should happen is that the real interest rate uh, will fall. Um, and uh, this will reduce people's savings, increase you know, their consumption and so on, and, and bring the market back into equilibrium. And in fact, this is what would happen in a perfect markets model, even if the nominal interest rate were at the zero lower bound. So how does this actually work if the nominal interest rate is at the zero lower bound? Right? Because then the nominal interest rate is fixed at zero. How does the real interest rate do what it's supposed to do to equilibrate markets? Well, the way it works is that prices are a jump variable in the perfect markets model. So prices, the level of prices would jump down, then there would be inflation. So with a fixed nominal interest rate and an increase in inflation, the real interest rate would fall, even though the nominal interest rate was fixed. And this would equilibrate markets and, and we would avoid a big recession. But the question is, is this really going to happen? Um, and it, of course, it's very different from what actually did happen in the aftermath of the financial crisis. In fact, in the aftermath of the financial crisis, inflation actually fell uh, instead of rising. So if nominal interest rates had stayed the same, the real interest rate would have risen as opposed to falling. So there you see how the fact that you know, prices essentially never jump uh, as they would in, in the perfect markets model can potentially make a big difference, a sign difference where in the perfect markets model, inflation is supposed to uh, rise, prices are supposed to jump down, and then there's going to be inflation. And in contrast with these, um, with these pricing frictions, maybe you get exactly the opposite, that prices sort of, um, sort of fall slowly, and that's actually associated with deflation or lower inflation. And potentially, these effects can be very large. So the, the, the biggest example of this, the one that in some sense uh, motivated uh, macroeconomics as a field is the Great Depression. So take 1931. In 1931, the economy was in a free fall. Uh, there had been a major banking crisis. The US was still on a gold standard. Um, prices were falling um, at an incredibly rapid rate. Uh, they fell by 30%, uh, peak to trough uh, in the first phase of the Great Depression. So that's over uh, a couple of years. Uh, so inflation was massively negative. And um, you know, estimates suggest that inflation expectations were also quite negative. So instead of uh, leading to a fall in the real interest rate, which is presumably what was needed, um, given the massive uh, economic contraction that was going on, things went the opposite direction. Real interest rates were actually very elevated during this period. And, um, and presumably that didn't, that didn't help much in terms of the economy. Now, things turned around on a dime. Uh, when Roosevelt came into office uh, and goes off gold, um, but, uh, but the situation until that point in, involved very high real interest rates. So you can see from that example, uh, potentially how severe these effects can be. One point that I wanna make is that the response of the real interest rate is not just something that matters in response to monetary shocks. So we tend to learn about these ideas like price rigidity, um, in the context of a discussion of monetary policy, monetary policy shocks. But in fact, the way that the real interest rate responds matters for how the economy responds to all shocks. Uh, so for example, responses to wealth shocks, like uh, changes in stock market wealth, or house price wealth. Uh, the response to uh, the main drivers you might imagine of, of business cycles. Um, all of these things, uh, their effect on the economy will depend on how the real interest rate effect uh, how the real interest rate responds. You know, so how plausible it is, for example, that, that animal spirit shocks or optimism can uh, drive booms and recessions. 
Um, the answers to those questions will depend um, very fundamentally in a macroeconomic model on what you assume about the behavior of prices and what you assume about, about the response to the real interest rate to these shocks. Now, one thing that I, I want to highlight, which I think is a shortcoming of the macroeconomics literature and where I think um, finance you know, has and, and can play a very important role, is in thinking about really why it is that the real interest rate might be important. So in simple macroeconomic models, the way the real interest rate feeds into the model is through intertemporal substitution. So you think about something like the consumption order equation or a simple model of investment and higher real interest rates are going to lead to less consumption and less investment and so on. And this is the way it works in, um, you know, undergraduate classes on macroeconomics. But I think there's a real and important question of whether that is, in fact, the key mechanism. And there's been, um, you know, a lot of interesting work um, trying to go further in this dimension, but I think that there could be even more. For example, it may be that banks and the way that they respond to changes in the real interest rate by changing credit constraints may be very important in terms of the monetary transmission mechanism. It may also be that wealth effects, for example, the effects of wealth prices and of, of stock prices and house prices on, um, on consumers uh, is, is a central mechanism. So I think this is a, a clear place where, where there are important synergies between macroeconomics and finance. Another um, place where um, the unit of account and price rigidity matters that might not have occurred to you is in thinking about digital currencies. So to illustrate this point, um, let, me, let me give you a little um, example. So suppose I, I invent my own digital currency. I'm gonna call it the ME dollar. So because it's my own digital currency, I have the printing presses, at least in the sense that, you know, I have a ledger on my computer. Um, I, I have an account for each one of you and I can inject ME dollars into your account at will, as many of them as I want. And then now that I have this digital currency, I can obviously make ME FOMC announcements of the interest rate on my own digital currency, right? Because, because I, I, I have uh, free control over all monetary policy relating to the ME dollar, so I can do whatever I want with the interest rate on this currency. So the question arises, does this matter? Is there some sense in which my announcements about interest rates or generally monetary policy on my digital currency will affect real interest rates in the economy as a whole, will in some way compete um, with, uh, with what Jay Powell is doing, and so on? Well, I think the obvious answer uh, is no. Uh, you know, I think you all know that's true intuitively, but maybe the more interesting question to think about is why? Why does it not matter? And I think that a crucial reason is because of the fact that nobody sets prices in ME dollars. Uh, the ME dollar plays no role at all as a unit of account. So as a consequence, my monetary actions in ME dollars, uh, my interest rate changes, won't have any impact uh, on the real interest rate. The only thing they're going to do is change the exchange rate between ME dollars and real uh, dollars. And so for this reason, in thinking about digital currencies as well, the question of the unit of account, the extent to which the US dollar continues to be a primary unit of account, for example, I think plays an enormous role. And, and of course, there's an obvious analogy with other digital currencies, like, for example, Bitcoin. So let me now move on to uh, the second set of evidence that I want to discuss, which I'm broadly going to call macro evidence on the behavior of prices. So here I'm going to talk not so much about individual prices, but about inflation. Um, and in, in that context, uh, I'm going to talk about the Phillips curve. Uh, the Phillips curve is one of the main sort of formal tools that macroeconomists have used to think about the behavior of inflation. So, um, so in this context, uh, one of the main challenges um, that arises is that once you start thinking about inflation, instead of thinking about individual prices, it's not that there are no changes for, for periods of time and then you know, big changes as in the case of, um, of individual prices. Rather, the question becomes whether inflation is responding by the right amount, by a large enough amount. And so in this context, um, the issue of identification uh, becomes much more important. We're no longer just asking a question, did prices change, change at all over some period of time when we knew that there was some kind of underlying shock? The question becomes by whether inflation changed by the right amount in response to a particular shock. 
And so um, identification is going to become a much more front and central, uh, front and center issue here. And uh, new methods for identification, I think, have been an important part of uh, growing understanding about these issues. So two um, major tools, I think, in that um, arena today um, that I'm going to talk about are discontinuity and heteroscedasticity based identification and the increasing use of, of regional data and panel data. So let me start with the first um, discontinuity or heteroscedasticity based identification. So the idea here is that when you see a really large change in level or in volatility, then potentially this might allow you, um, if you if you zero in around that change, to kind of distinguish the effect of that particular shock from other uh, potential shocks, which are sort of changing in a more continuous way. A classic example of this kind of methodology comes from Musa. So here I'm showing you a picture that we constructed, but is you know based on his idea. Um, so this is showing you the U.S. German um, real exchange rate uh, around the time of the breakdown of Bretton Woods. So the point that's being made here is that when Bretton Woods breaks down, um, the, these two countries go from a fixed exchange rate system to um, a flexible exchange rate system. And this is an entirely monetary action. So it really is just about units. And if prices were adjusting in a flexible way, the units, you know, like I've emphasized, shouldn't matter. And yet, when you look at the real exchange rate, um, when you move from the flexible, sorry, the fixed to the flexible exchange rate system, you see this really big increase in volatility. And it's hard to argue with the idea that it really was the breakdown of Bretton Woods, the switch uh, from the, flex, the fixed to the flexible exchange rate system that caused um, this change in the volatility of the real exchange rate as opposed to something else. And so here you see the power of uh, this kind of discontinuity-based identification. Because usually the challenge with identifying the effects of monetary policy shocks is it's hard to tell whether it was really the monetary policy action or, um, or it was something else that maybe caused the monetary policy action that, that might be going on. But here you, you have such a dramatic uh, regime shift that, that it seems clear that, that, it, that it was, in fact, the monetary policy change. Another example of this, uh, which has become increasingly important um, in both, I think, the macro and finance literature is to look at what happens around the time of FOMC announcements. So here I'm showing uh, you a picture from a seminal paper by Gerkinek, Sack, and Swanson. Um, so this is a picture of intraday trading in Fed Fund's future markets um, around 2.15 p.m. on Tuesdays, around the time that uh, the FOMC makes its announcement. So you can, here you can see that there's this very sharp change in futures prices around this time. And just like with the Musa paper, um, the power of this approach is that typically the huge problem in trying to um, identify the effects of monetary policy shocks is that it's hard to tell um, the direction of causality. So maybe you see something change, but it was it really that the monetary policy uh, shock caused the change? Or was it there was some other shock that caused both the monetary policy change and the outcome you're interested in? But here, because you can really zero in on um, what's happening around the time of the FOMC announcement, you can assume that, say, if there was good or bad macro news that happened um, even earlier that week or the previous week, that's already uh, been taken into consideration in these uh, financial market prices. And, and the response here is the response um, particularly to the FOMC announcement, so the monetary shock. So in, in, um, in our own work, um, John and I have um, used a very simple summary statistic of uh, the reactions to monetary policy shocks, which is just to look at the first principal component of changes in interest rate futures around the time of these FOMC announcements. So what we did is we looked at changes in Fed funds futures and Euro dollar futures um, going out spanning the first year after, after the FOMC announcement. So intuitively, this is kind of giving you a sense of how changes in interest rate expectations, um, the, the common component of changes in interest rate expectations over the first year after the FOMC announcement. And we did this for the period 2000 to 2014. This is a, a table uh, from our paper. And what we're doing here is we're running regressions of the nominal and real interest rate um, as measured by tips and then break even inflation from tips in response to uh, what we call the policy news shock, which is this first principal component that I just described. So the first 
three rows are showing you the response of treasury yields and the bottom four are showing you the response of forwards and um, the, the response of yield is, is, um, is a little bit more precise, but it's a little bit more intuitive to think about the forwards. So let's focus on the forwards. So the first column here is in some sense just describing the shock, um, because remember it's a, it's, a, it's a first principal component of interest rate changes over the first year after the FOMC announcement. And um, what these um, responses are showing you is that, in fact, um, this monetary policy shock, which is constructed as what's happening to interest rate expectations over the first year after the FOMC announcement, is in fact uh, affecting expectations about interest rates going uh, considerably further out into the term structure. So there are, there are effects uh, several years into the term structure on nominal interest rates. But in some sense, this is a description of a shock and is you know, bearing out a point that Gerke, Naksak, and Swanson made in their paper that a lot of monetary policy, it's not just about the current Fed funds rate, but it's actually about expectations, about future interest rates. And in fact, that's been true for a long time, even before the time uh, when we started talking a lot about forward guidance. So, in, so FOMC announcements can, can affect interest rates, not just in, in the immediate future, but, but, but actually going several years out into the term structure. But the main point um, we had in doing this was to look at uh, the effect on the real interest rate as measured by ticks. So remember, this is sort of a big dividing line in macro models, um, because in a model with frictionless price adjustment, what would happen is that even though the Fed would control the nominal interest rate, there would be no impact on the real interest rate because the effect would be entirely absorbed by inflation. In fact, what you see in the data, however, is that the real interest rate is adjusting almost uh, one for one um, with the nominal interest rate. Um, it, it, you know, this effect goes to zero at very long horizons, uh, but several years into the term structure, there's almost a one for one um, adjustment of the real interest rate. And you know, equivalently, the effect on expected inflation as measured by tips is, um, is, is close to zero. Eventually, at long horizons, it becomes negative, um, and that's you know sort of intuitive. Um, you could say it's the right direction in the sense that this is a contractionary monetary policy shock, and what we're seeing is that eventually people expect this to lead to lower inflation. But in the short run, the effect is pretty small. Um, so the summary of this table is that you know sort of consistent with what I showed you earlier, you see pretty big effects on the real interest rate, um, and and pretty small um, and very delayed effects on expected inflation. Now, you know, I, I probably don't have to remind you that this is sort of all in the heads of the bond market traders, but, um, but from, from their perspective, um, we, we see these big effects on the, the real interest rate um, and, and, and small and delayed effects on expected inflation. Here's a scatter plot uh, just showing you what, what I just showed you. On the x-axis, I'm showing you this policy news shock, so a summary uh, measure of the monetary policy action or the effect of the, the monetary policy shock on interest rates over the first year after the FOMC announcement. And on the y-axis, it's the effect on the real interest rate. And you can see that there's a pretty um, clear positive causal effect of, of changes in the nominal interest rate on changes in the real interest rate. So it's sort of consistent with this idea um, of, of small and, uh, and, and delayed responses of inflation. Now, one question you might um, be asking yourself um, is, um, is it really possible that these kinds of effects that I showed you, you know, the effect of the nominal interest rate um, announcements of the Fed on the real interest rate, could those kinds of effects really plausibly come uh, from price rigidity? Because even a lot of price rigidity, you might think, uh, might last for, say, a year, two years, you know, can, it, can, can we really um, envision uh, effects on the real interest rate going out three years um, that have anything to do with price rigidity. So here it's good to um, go back to Milton Friedman's analogy to daylight savings time. Um, so remember when we talked about um, why, um, why it is that there might be uh, frictions in adjusting schedules, it's not only about the fact that I myself uh, find it you know, painful to keep track of my own schedule and, and continuously adjust meeting times with, with my co-authors and so on. It's also because of all the strategic complementarities between my meeting times and other people's meeting times. And the existence of all of these complementarities um, means that, um, that it's, it's, it's not just my own friction, but all of these interactions um, that, that, that ultimately affect the duration of the rigidity um, in, say, meeting time adjustment. 
And the same kind of story holds true for prices as well. Um, so an important uh, idea in the monetary economics literature is that um, even if nominal price or GDP is there, it's probably not the whole story. Uh, that, that even conditional on adjusting a price to the extent that you know, firms have complementarities in setting their prices, say Folgers cares what price Maxwell House sets, even when they do adjust their price, um, they may not just adjust it sort of all the way. And potentially the combination of these two forces, nominal price rigidity and coordination frictions can lead to adjustment uh, frictions that last a long time and plausibly can actually explain the kind of patterns um, that we see here where, 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 there are, where there are pretty long lasting effects of say a nominal interest rate change on the real interest rate. So now let me, let me move on to, to my last topic here, which is um, the use of, of regional data to try to think um, about inflation dynamics. And the uh, application I'm going to talk about here is the Phillips curve. So the Phillips curve is the main sort of theoretical construct that macroeconomists have used to think about inflation. And here I'm going to draw on some joint work I have with Jonathan Hazel, Juan Jaramillo, and with John Steinson. So here's a, a common formulation of the Phillips curve. Um, I have on the left-hand side inflation, on the right-hand side unemployment minus the natural rate, and then I have expected inflation and a measure of supply shocks. So the first term is probably the one that you hear talked about the most in the news. Um, so the idea here is to look at the response of inflation to um, what people broadly refer to as aggregate demand, the difference you know, as measured here by the difference between unemployment and some measure of the level of unemployment that would arise in a frictionless economy. So it's the natural rate of unemployment. The kappa term here, which is representing how big that response would be, is what people call the slope of the Phillips curve. And this first um, component of the Phillips curve is what, um, what people refer to as the old Keynesian Phillips curve. Old Keynesian because it didn't include the second term, which is the expectations term. So Freeman and Phelps uh, went beyond this original formulation of the Phillips curve, which just had um, you know, the, the, the slope of the Phillips curve in it, the response to aggregate demand shocks, to add this additional term, uh, which is expected inflation. The idea here is that even if unemployment is equal to its natural rate, even if supply and demand are sort of broadly speaking uh, equal to each other, if people expect a whole lot of inflation um, in the future, that can be a self-fulfilling prophecy. You can actually have high inflation today. And then finally, um, there's this supply shock term. And when um, I taught this in intermediate macroeconomics classes, historically, I always used to have a hard time coming up with examples for supply shocks, aside from maybe the oil shocks of the 70s. Since the COVID crisis, this has become a lot less hard uh, because you know, COVID actually truly is an example of a supply shock. So I'll come back to that in talking about the present situation, but, um, but certainly this, this, this has become much more salient in the last uh, two years. So how do we estimate um, this equation? So I think a lot of people's reaction um, is uh, that this is a complete disaster. And it's not unjustified because all of these are endogenous variables. You have inflation, unemployment, expected inflation. These are all highly endogenous variables, which broadly speaking respond to the same set of shocks. So it's going to be very tricky, and it's going to take a lot more than just OLS, uh, probably. Plus, you know, maybe very careful OLS, but but clearly it's going to be very tricky um, with all these um, endogenous variables. Um, you know, the supply shocks potentially affecting unemployment and affecting uh, inflation, and so on. But is it completely hopeless? Uh, well, it's very challenging. Um, I think it does mean that that simple OLS strategies are unlikely to be convincing. But I don't think it's completely hopeless because, because it actually resembles uh, a problem that economists have spent decades at least grappling with, which is just the basic problem of um, estimating the slope of the demand curve um, in a simultaneous equation system, right? So, so, you know, when you have a demand and a supply curve and prices and quantities are, um, are identified in this system, it's the same kind of situation where all the variables are endogenous, you're trying to figure out the slope. Um, of one of the two curves. Um, and um, you know, over, over, over several decades, people have come up with different empirical methods that can be used for that. 
um, that situation. In particular, careful identification approaches uh, that use instruments or, um, or other approaches to try to absorb uh, the sources of the endogeneity. And the same issues arise here with the added difficulty that you also have this inflation expectations term. So you sort of have the usual problems of demand versus supply shocks that arise in the context of demand curve estimation with the added problem of this inflation expectations term. But at least there's a sense in which I think this should ring a bell for us as economists. One um, approach that, that we found useful in thinking about the Phillips curve in our own work is to solve for the Phillips curve. Um, that means to recursively substitute in to this previous equation. Um, so take the inflation on the left-hand side and recursively substitute it into the right-hand side to get this formulation of the Phillips curve. What's useful about this formulation of the Phillips curve is that now, instead of having inflation expectations one period ahead, I have inflation expectations um, you know, in, in the infinite future. And here, I have a discounted present sum of the cyclical component of unemployment. So what's appealing about this is that one period ahead, inflation expectations are a super endogenous object. When we think of them as naturally falling in recessions and naturally rising in booms, in contrast, this long run inflation expectations term is much closer to something like the inflation target of the central bank. And so I think this equation um, sort of can give us quite a bit of intuition about the drivers of inflation and, in fact, um, about the way that these conversations are framed uh, even today about the level of inflation. There are basically two components. One, um, this discounted present value of cyclical unemployment is you know, telling us that demand pressures matter. It doesn't just matter what the current unemployment rate, but it matters how persistent uh, these demand pressures are. The second term um, is telling us that the long run uh, level of inflation, the long run inflation target of the central bank is going to be very important. And importantly, um, the slope of the Phillips curve kappa, it applies to the first term. Um, so potentially this can be quite small. Uh, maybe inflation doesn't respond very rapidly uh, to, to changes in demand pressure. But this second term has a coefficient of one, regardless of what uh, the coefficient on the first term is. So this um, long run inflation expectations term can be very important, even if the slope of the Phillips curve is very low. So this, I think, is an important lesson um, and, and one that you know, has been learned in a number of countries that have had both very high inflation and very big uh, disinflations as well that this long run inflation target can be a major determinant of current inflation. Um, current inflation moves one for one um, with beliefs about the long run inflation target, even if the slope of the Phillips curve is very low. And it also shows um, sort of very strikingly one of the estimation challenges with the Phillips curve. That you, know, you might imagine that you could estimate the Phillips curve by running a regression of inflation on unemployment, but you potentially have this very important um, omitted variables bias problem, that it could be that inflation is moving around even with no change um, in, in the unemployment rate because of changes in beliefs uh, about the inflation target and sort of the extent of the, the, the monetary authority's commitment to this inflation target. And in fact, empirically, those changes have been very important. So here I'm showing you for CPI inflation going back to the late 1970s. So that's the black line here. So here is the, the period of uh, double digit inflation that we saw around 1980 in the United States. Um, we then saw a, a massive drop in inflation. So this is the Volcker disinflation I'll talk about uh, quite a bit in a, in a few minutes. Um, throughout the 1990s, um, you know, inflation um, continued to, to fall. Um, and then, you know, since 2000, we've seen a, a period of relative stability of inflation. There have been certainly cyclical variations uh, and then a big spike recently. What about long run inflation expectations? So this is the survey of professionals, survey of professional forecasters measure of uh, expected inflation over the next 10 years. Um, you see that this fell very dramatically in the early 1980s, but it actually continued to fall through the 1990s. Uh, then since the late 1990s, it's been almost completely stable, around 2%. Um, it has risen uh, somewhat in, uh, in the last uh, you know, nine months, um, but, but still remains relatively stable. Now, one um, idea, uh, given all of these challenges with the estimation of the Phillips curve, is whether perhaps regional data uh, could help. 
And you might think they could, um, because um, if you look at different states in the United States, they in fact have uh, somewhat different business cycles. So there is a big common component, but there also are important differences. So here I'm showing unemployment for three different states, California, Texas, and Pennsylvania. And you can see, for example, that Texas um, had almost an extra recession in the late 1980s, you know, probably relating to the fact that Texas is an oil state. Uh, or that um, the Great Recession was much more severe for California than for Texas and Pennsylvania, uh, you know, because the housing uh, boom and bust was, was much more severe in California than these other states. So potentially this kind of idiosyncratic variation by state uh, might be able to help us identify the slope of the Phillips curve. And in particular, you might sort of envision a diff and diff approach. So suppose we see that Texas goes into a boom, but Illinois does not. Um, could we use a diff and diff approach? So let's ask, how much does inflation rise in Texas relative to Illinois when we see these different business cycle outcomes for the two different states? And there are a lot of advantages of, of going down this route from the perspective of the empirical challenges I just described. So um, you can absorb a lot of the, the common supply shocks in time fixed effects. Um, the long-run inflation expectations, you can also absorb in time fixed effects, and you're just going to have more data points. There are a lot more um, you know, local booms and recessions than if you just look at the aggregate data. There are also more options for identification, more potential sources of, of instruments and so on that you could use to deal with these um, really severe challenges of identification. But there's also um, a very important set of challenges. And, and I think this set of challenges is probably something that, that comes up in, in a number of areas of finance research as well, which is that when you estimate the slope of a regional Phillips curve, it's really not obvious that the lessons from that estimation will carry over directly into thinking about the slope of the aggregate Phillips curve. Because you really are estimating a different parameter. In the one case, you're looking at the response of relative prices in say one state versus another to, um, to relative differences in unemployment. Whereas in the other case, you're looking at the effect on aggregate inflation. So it's not obvious that you're answering the same question. And from one perspective, they are fundamentally different experience, experiments. At the same time, you know, there's sort of intuition that they would be related, right? If there's a huge amount of price rigidity, you would think it would show up not only in how the aggregate price level responds, but also in how the regional price level response. But despite that kind of intuition, there is fundamentally this challenge of external validity when you use regional data. Um, how do you go from the regional to the aggregate? And how do you think about external validity? Well, in this particular case, um, one thing one can do is look at the implications of a simple structural model. So in our paper, we thought about um, you know, a simple structural model with different states. And it turns out that in that model, you can write down a regional Phillips curve. That's this equation here. It has the same basic components as the aggregate Phillips curve. So the first term on the right-hand side is a discounted present value of cyclical unemployment. Um, the second last term here is uh, long-run inflation expectations. Then we have the supply shock term. And there's one additional term that relates to relative uh, prices across the state. So this is this is sort of a terms of trade term. So it, it does have the same basic structure in this simple model as the aggregate Phillips curve. And interestingly, it actually has the same slope. So this kappa parameter here, um, which is the slope of the aggregate Phillips curve, we can show in this simple model that it's the same as, as the aggregate Phillips curve. The advantage of, of this regional Phillips curve, however, is that we can actually estimate it using panel data. So this huge problem of long run inflation expectations that we ran into with the aggregate data, uh, we can deal with it in a, in a, in a, in a regional setting by, by having time fixed effects. So what we're able to show is that in this simple model, in fact, there is um, you know, not just an intuition, but a strong theoretical analogy between the regional Phillips curves and the aggregate Phillips curves. And you can, in fact, learn a lot about the aggregate parameters uh, you want to know about from looking at the regional data. I want to emphasize that this is a simple model, um, but I think that even beyond this exact equivalence, uh, it's likely that the regional Phillips curves will still be informative about uh, the magnitude of, of this kappa, the slope of the aggregate Phillips curve. And I think that this set of ideas that even away from an exact equivalence, you could potentially have, um, have, have moments 
um, that come from IV regression or panel regressions that can be very informative about parameters uh, in structural models uh, that, that, that they're applicable to other kinds of policy experiments, such as aggregate policy experiments, is, is, is an idea that is becoming increasingly important um, in, in empirical um, approaches to, to answering macroeconomic questions. This is something that John and I talk about in, a, in our survey paper in 2018, and, and it's also related um, to the ideas that Andrew uh, Genskow and Shapiro um, have talked about in recent work. And aside um, is, um, again, you know, I've been talking a lot about, you know, kappa, the slope of the Phillips curve, and the idea that, you know, that, that, that this represents imperfect uh, price adjustment. And I want to, again, sort of belabor the idea that even though it's closely connected uh, to these ideas um, I talked about at the beginning, the pictures I showed you of literal price rigidity, that we probably don't think about uh, kappa as being only about price rigidity. In some sense, price rigidity, the fact that the Italian uh, hairdresser literally didn't change their price for four years is the easiest thing to measure because you don't have to observe costs at all, you don't have to think about identification and so on, but it's very unlikely that this is the full story. Um, in, in fact, um, you know, most estimates in macroeconomics suggest that uh, literal price rigidity is probably some, you know, less than half of the story, that, that you have to incorporate some other force, which in macroeconomics is usually referred to as real rigidities, such as the fact that there's coordination uh, failure between price setters, such as the fact that there's wage rigidity, uh, monopoly power, decreasing returns, uh, various forces such as this uh, that mean that even when you adjust your prices, given that everyone else isn't adjusting at the same time, you don't go, go, go all the way. Um, but, you know, of course, this is much uh, harder to measure. And in some sense, uh, that's part of the reason there's such uh, a strong degree um, of a focus on, on both micro and macro approaches to estimating the extent of, of pricing frictions. So in the context of the regional data, um, you still have these identification problems. I'm not going to go into detail exactly how we address them in our paper. But the point I want to make that is that uh, once you are using regional data, a major advantage is that you do have more options for identification. So in our paper, we use something like a, a BARTIC uh, instrument, um, for those of you who are familiar with that idea from, from Applied Micro. And, and those are identification approaches that just aren't available using only aggregate data, but become available to you uh, once you're using, uh, once you're using disaggregated data uh, to estimate these effects. So I think there really are a lot of um, advantages to being able to draw these analogies uh, between what's happening across cross-sectional units and what's happening at the aggregate level. So do we get anything um, interesting out of this approach? Well, I think there are some, some, some interesting lessons. So in particular, um, it's, it's hard to, to, to even sort of remember this at, at this point in time, given all the recent discussion of high inflation in the United States. But for the last several decades, the primary, um, I'm sorry, I shouldn't say several decades, but at least since uh, you know, 2000, I would say, um, that the primary discussion when it came to inflation in the Phillips curve was really whether the slope of the Phillips curve um, was falling or whether it was in fact completely zero. And so the, the major topic of debate was the extent of flattening in the Phillips curve. And, and one often saw a picture like the one I have on the left-hand side here, where the evidence suggested a very steep Phillips curve for the, the 1980s, you know, um, but that post-1990 or post-2000, the Phillips curve uh, was almost completely flat. And so this is something I'm replicating here um, using our data. And importantly, this is based on the um, regional data, but not including time fixed difference. Um, so the importance of that is I'm not taking out the effect of changing long run inflation expectations. But a big payoff of moving to these regional data is that I can include um, these uh, time fixed effects, which are going to sweep out the effects of common factors that are affecting all states. So in particular, inflation expectations long run inflation expectations were, were falling like a stone in, in all states in the United States in the early 1980s. Uh, once I include uh, time fixed effects that, that account for that effect, then the slope of the Phillips curve really looks much more stable um, between the first uh, part of the sample period, the 19, late 1970s and early 1980s, and the latter part of the sample period. 
there's uh, so there's you know the, the, the extent of flattening is, is much less uh, than, than in the case where we don't include uh, these time fixed effects. And the real reason for this is uh, that once we move to this important empirical formulation where we're, we're able to account um, for uh, changing uh, regimes and changing expectations about inflation in the long run, it turns out that this matters a lot. And in particular, the, the interpretation of the Volcker disinflation is, is very different. Uh, so one interpretation of the Volcker disinflation that you, you might have heard um, is just the idea that the Phillips curve was very steep in the past um, and, and maybe is not so steep anymore. But according to, to, to this methodology, you end up with a, with a different interpretation. Um, the interpretation you end up from this methodology is that inflation in the Volcker disinflation fell mostly due to the declines in long run inflation expectations. So in other words, the regime changes that happened as part of, um, as part of uh, Volcker's changes in, in the policy of the Fed. And that um, only 2% of the decline in inflation that happened around this period was actually due to the steep Phillips curve. In other words, high unemployment. Another conclusion you get out of this analysis is that you really do need supply shocks. Um, and the natural candidate would be oil shocks to explain the very high inflation that we saw in the early 1980s. So one thing this underscores is the importance of long-run beliefs about inflation. This is really putting a lot of emphasis, uh, not just on the slope of the Phillips curve, but on the anchoring of people's ex expectations uh, about inflation in the long run. And I think this is an area, another area where I think, even though there has been a lot of interesting work, I think uh, we could do, do even more. You know, these are very important questions. How does the monetary authority change people's beliefs about long-run inflation expectations? This is fundamentally hard, um, it's clear that a lot of time, the time people don't pay much attention to what the Fed says. Um, for the last um, many years, since the late 1990s, there's obviously a, been a lot of confidence around the idea that inflation would be close to 2% in the long run. But at the same time, we know that sometimes beliefs about inflation do change rapidly. So for example, the Volcker disinflation or the ends of hyperinflation. And so, you know, I think a, a really crucial question is how these beliefs change and you know how the Fed convinces people that it's that it's serious uh, about um, you know keeping inflation low in the long run. A short digression, you know, that I think you know doesn't provide all the answers, but sort of gives you some color about the past. Um, for those of you who are not sort of familiar with this story, it's kind of interesting to know something about uh, what happened with inflation in the 1970s and 80s. So in the 1970s, inflation was was rising. Uh, over a pretty sustained period of time. Um, and there was quite a bit of, of, of public outrage over this, which led to a lot of policies that were aimed to um, control inflation. So Nixon in 1971 instituted wage and price controls. Ford in 1974 called inflation public enemy number one. It had these with inflation now win buttons. Carter. Um, described um, inflation this way. He said, persistent high inflation threatens the economic security of our country. And I think before the last year, when I would talk about these things, I, I found it harder to relate to the intensity of the emotion that people uh, felt about inflation. But, but, but I feel like the experience of the last uh, you know, six or nine months has, has made me be able to relate to this much more as you see just how much people hate inflation. So this culminated with, in October 1979, um, Paul Volcker was appointed as chairman of the Fed. Um, it was widely known um, that uh, his intention was to bring down inflation, not in a gradual way, but um, very rapidly. Um, and yet, even despite um, everyone knowing that was the case, um, given the political climate, I think given um, how unpopular inflation clearly was, he was still appointed. So he set as a goal to bring inflation down below 4%. He dramatically raised interest rates. Uh, the Fed's fund, Fed's, Fed funds rate reached a record high of 20% in 1980. Um, so he tightened policy very dramatically. Um, there was a huge recession. Um, but I think sort of amazingly, uh, perhaps in, in, in when you think about the political um, situation and, and the challenges associated with uh, taking policies that, that cause recessions, he didn't get fired. Um, and presumably, uh, the fact that he was able to do this um, caused a huge recession and um, 
brought down inflation rapidly, but, but stayed in, in, in power um, is one of the things that was crucial in changing beliefs about um, the, the, the goals of the Fed, the ability of the Fed to, um, to really stay the course in bringing down inflation and, and what the long run monetary regime was in the United States. So what, what, what are the lessons um, from the past, I think, that are relevant to the present situation? Um, because I now want to sort of move into thinking about um, how, how some of these ideas apply uh, to the current situation where, where we really are seeing um, developments in inflation that, that are quite different from what we've seen from the last two decades. So I think one important message is that long run inflation expectations are a key driver of inflation. And you know, we need to, to think seriously about um, how these are formed, how they change, um, how central bank policies affect them. A second lesson is that in terms of the historical experience, demand-driven inflation, um, you know, it does have a systematic effect. Uh, there is a systematic effect of the unemployment gap, cyclical unemployment on inflation. Uh, but at least um, given um, stable inflation expectations, so when people are convinced that the longer inflation target of the Fed is around 2%, and with um, a typical amount of persistence of these shocks, then the effects are, you know, have, have been pretty modest historically. Uh, a one percent increase in unemployment, based on the regional estimates, is roughly associated with a one third of percent increase in inflation. And I'll show you some pictures that sort of illustrate how that plays out in the aggregate data. A third message, um, based on both the regional data and, and I'll show it to you also in the aggregate data, is that the shelter component of the CPI, um, which is measured by rent, has uh, the highest cyclical sensitivity. This is a, uh, a point that Jim Stock and Mark Watson have also made in, in, in several papers. And finally, it's hard to explain the experience in the 1970s and 1980s without some role for supply shocks. Um, it's, that, that hasn't played um, as important a role in the last two decades, um, but, but it's hard to explain um, the experience in the 1970s and 1980s without supply shocks. And I, I'm going to argue, I think it's hard to explain the recent experience uh, without supply shocks as well. So let me start by showing you this picture. Uh, so this is um, core CPI and the unemployment rate going back to 1990. Why did I choose 1990? I chose 1990 because um, long run inflation expectations, uh, you know, I showed you that they continued to fall until the late 1990s. So they haven't quite stabilized by 1990, but they're kind of on their way to stabilizing. You know, some of the continued decrease in inflation um, that you see during the 1990s, I think, certainly should be attributed to the continued decline in long run inflation expectations over this time period. But um, this is a period where you're, you're starting to see some stabilization. So when you look at this picture, so the blue line is um, core CPI, the red line is the unemployment rate. You see what I mean about the, um, about the systematic but, um, but small response of uh, inflation to unemployment in the past. So it is true that systematically when you go into recession, so the, the shading is showing the time of recessions, like for example, the, the Great Recession, um, you've seen uh, some decline in inflation, um, but these effects have been relatively muted. Um, you know, and, it, and it, you might react to this picture in different ways. I mean, obviously there's a lot of noise here and, and this is where, you know, I think the regional data is helpful in convincing us that this relationship is really there. But I, I, I would summarize uh, the facts as, as suggesting a systematic but, but small relationship. Now here I'm adding COVID. Um, you see the historic rise in unemployment associated with COVID up to about 15%. You also see, however, that the increase in unemployment um, was accompanied by an equally rapid almost decrease in unemployment. So it's, you know, um, the fastest recovery on, on record of unemployment by, by far. So um, certainly the, the decline in inflation uh, associated with the onset of COVID was much less than this one third of a percent number that I, I cited. Um, but I think it's, it's fairly easy to explain that in the sense that if you remember what the expression um, for the slope of the Phillips curve looked like, it's actually a response to a discounted present value of cyclical unemployment. And COVID was such a, a transient increase in unemployment, not just transient, but I think it was expected to tra be transient. I remember when I left my office um, after 
the initial onset of COVID, you know, people saying, well, maybe it'll be a few months. And so I think um, this was a case where um, the recession was perhaps people were maybe persistently optimistic about how long it was going to last. And that was probably one of the things that meant that inflation didn't fall as much as you might have expected um, in the initial onset of COVID. What else could explain uh, why we didn't see a, a huge decline in inflation associated with COVID? Well, the obvious other reason is supply shocks. Uh, so as I said earlier, you know, when I, when I used to give lectures on these topics to, to undergraduates, it was hard to come up with examples of supply shocks. That's no longer true. There are very obvious reasons um, why COVID actually did lower productivity um, during, um, you know, through, for example, people's need to, to care for sick workers, being sick themselves, new safety regulations, and so on. So all those things are things that, um, you know, would have mitigated the fall in costs or increased costs and, and lowered the fall in, in inflation. So uh, an additional message I had was this idea that, that shelter is the most cyclical component of uh, inflation. And so here's a picture showing that. Um, the um, unemployment rate is the green line. Um, the, the red line is, um, is shelter, inflation and shelter. And the gray line is all items except for shelter. So you can see that shelter has this particularly systematic uh, relationship. Um, with unemployment. And you can see that that was true before COVID, and it's also been true during COVID. And in fact, the behavior of shelter inflation, both in terms of the initial onset of COVID and the experience uh, during the recovery from COVID, has looked uh, not so different uh, from historical experience. Um, on the other hand, if you look at the uh, non-shelter component, you see you know, certainly it's much less cyclical, not clear that there's much of a cyclical relationship at all. You know, one interpretation, of course, is that this component is much more exposed to, to supply shocks. And you've seen a very dramatic increase in this component in the recent period. Um, now, there, I think there are two ways of reading the fact that, um, you know, shelter looks like it sort of has a similar relationship to unemployment as it did historically, whereas the non-shelter um, component looks very different. Um, one way which, um, you know, Jason Furman, among others, has been emphasizing is that, you know, maybe shelter is just on its way. It's just going to catch, catch up. Another, you know, another point is that shelter is probably a lot less exposed to certain types of supply shocks that have been important for the rest of the, of the basket. Um, so shelter involves less. So the labor input um, is obviously um, less influenced by the direct cost effects of, of COVID as well. Um, so in the last nine months, there's, as a consequence of, of these factors that I emphasized um, at the end of this series, uh, sort of a normal reaction of shelter, but a very abnormal reaction of the rest of the CPI basket, there's been a really big spike in inflation. Um, and this is true even though unemployment is higher than it was pre-COVID. So if you took, you know, the very simple Phillips curve formulation, you would say there's more slack than there was pre-COVID. Uh, one, I think, natural reaction to this is that unemployment is a very imperfect measure of labor market tightness. Um, so while, you know, they're, they're, this was maybe a reasonable measure of labor market tightness in normal times, COVID has changed things in very unprecedented ways. In particular, vacancies are very high relative to unemployment right now. There's been a completely unprecedented uh, decline um, in labor force participation. And there have been big sectoral shifts in the labor market, so big changes in where workers are needed. And potentially, this is one of the things that's really changing the extent to which unemployment um, can, can measure the extent of labor market tightness. And, and you know, vacancies, for example, suggest that we have a much tighter labor market than pre-COVID, even though unemployment um, has, has not fallen to the same level. The last uh, thing to discuss is the role of supply shocks. And as I said, I think, you know, it's pretty clear there have been some real supply shocks. Um, so there's been a, a really unprecedented decline in labor force participation associated with the COVID recession. There also are clearly direct costs of COVID for firms that I mentioned earlier, sick days, safety precautions, things like that. And then finally, one important thing to recognize is that there have been really um, substantial relative price shocks. Um, so um, I'll show you a graph in a moment um, illustrating this massive structural shift um, for demand from services to goods that many people have noted. Uh, and um, you know, one point uh, that has been made, uh, for example, in a recent paper by Guerreri and, and co-authors that they presented at Jackson Hole is that, that this looks like a supply shock in a model. Now, 
I think um, the fact that supply shocks are back is something that does draw an analogy to the 1970s. And in the 1970s, um, this eventually, at least over a period of time, led inflation expectations to become unhinged um, and led to um, you know, the inflation experience that I described uh, throughout the 1970s that, that culminated uh, with Volcker and, and the huge um, response to monetary policy. So just to show you this in graphs, um, here's the labor force participation rate. Um, you know, you see uh, not much of response of labor force participation in the last two recessions, but in the COVID crisis, you see a decline um, that appears to be persistent uh, on the order of, of, you know, one and a half percentage points or two percentage points. So that's a huge difference versus the experience in previous recessions. Here's the fraction of um, spending on goods versus services. So, um, you know, in some recessions, there hasn't been much of a change in this statistic at all. During the Great Recession, which was a particularly large recession, you saw a pretty substantial decline during the recession. I think the natural interpretation of this is just that people cut back a lot on, um, on goods spending, durable goods in particular, during recessions, you saw a big decline and then subsequently some increase. In the COVID recession, you see it looks completely different. There's a big spike um, in spending on goods uh, versus services. And I think you know, a natural interpretation of this is, is that people's preferences have really changed, uh, both because of regulations that make it harder for us to travel and consume other services, and because of fears that people have uh, about consuming services relative to goods. But this is a huge uh, change um, that you would expect to lead to changes in efficient relative prices. And the question is, how much is this going to translate not just into changes in relative prices, but maybe to changes in the aggregate price level? OK, and the, and the last graph I want to show you that, of course, is related to the amount of, of demand pressure is the personal savings rate. So you know, here's personal savings um, you know, starting from before 1990 to the present. And you can see that that is truly off the charts. Uh, so this is related to the combination of, of fiscal stimulus and all of the restrictions on uh, spending uh, that were part of the COVID crisis. So this is another uh, very unusual feature of COVID relative to any recession that we've seen. Now, um, so I think you know the, the fact that supply shocks are back. You know, it is something that makes us think about the 1970s, the 1980s. What are the ways in which this period um, looks very different? Uh, well, at least so far, um, we, we do see a lot of stability in terms of long run inflation expectations. So here um, is the, the core CPI inflation rate, um, the research series from the BLS. The gray line is the survey of professional forecasters, long run uh, 10 year ahead inflation expectations that I showed you before. And you can see that there's just a very small uptick this in, in the recent period um, in the face of a very large increase in core CPI. There are different measures that you can look at for long run inflation expectations. So I was showing the survey of professional forecasters. That's the, the blue line. Um, the, the green line here is five year ahead um, survey of professional forecasters inflation expectations. The orange line is 10 year ahead uh, break even inflation from tips. You can see that has somewhat more volatility. Um, but, but all of them suggest, uh, at least so far, um, substantially uh, more stability than we saw in the 70s and 80s. And of course, the Fed wants to keep it that way. So to conclude, um, I think that understanding the unit of account, um, even though uh, it gets into the nitty gritty of price setting and so on, is, is really crucial for understanding many phenomena in economics and finance. Um, of course, inflation, the real interest rate, which are really at the core of how the invisible hand works in economics, monetary policy, and even digital currencies. And I think it's also um, an interesting lab laboratory for seeing the ways in which different methodologies, looking at very micro granular data, uh, looking at natural experiments using discontinuities and heteroscedasticity uh, based identification, as well as using structural modeling to think about external validity issues can work together. Uh, to, to try to enhance our understanding um, of these effects. So let me stop there. Let me thank you so much. This has been, this has been very valuable for, for all of us. And um, I appreciate your giving the AFA lecture today. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure.